Hi everyone and welcome to Miss Estric Biology. In this video I'm going to be going through epistasis which is one of the topics in inheritance for A-level biology. So let's start with the definition and this could be a one mark question in the exam. So epistasis is when one gene influences the expression of another one. So any epistasis question you get will be a dihybrid example because it's always to do with two genes and it's one gene masking the expression of the other. So some examples, coat colour in mice is controlled by epistasis, coat colour in Labradors, and also the colour of certain squash fruits as well is controlled by epistasis. So let's have a look at some examples and we're gonna go through the Labrador example. So it's controlled by two genes and gene one controls whether the pigment which creates the colour in the fur is going to be expressed. Allele capital E is dominant and that codes for pigment production. The allele with the recessive E or lowercase e, that would code for no pigment being produced at all. So if you had a Labrador that had two copies of that recessive E allele, they would be yellow in colour or golden it's sometimes described as. So we're going to have a look at how then you could get a black and a chocolate Labrador. And this is down to gene 2. Gene 2 controls which pigment is expressed to give them that colour. And the dominant allele, which we're going to represent with the letter B, that codes for black fur. And the recessive allele, which is a lowercase b, codes for the brown fur. So we're going to have a look at a genetic cross to see the inheritance of these two particular genes to different alleles and therefore what phenotypes you'd get in the offspring. So in this example, these are the two parents. They're both heterozygous for both genes. And because they both have at least one dominant allele for the E gene, which is the one that codes for pigment, we know they will be either black or brown. So to see whether they're black or brown, we look at the second gene and they have a dominant B, which we said coded for black. So both of these parents are black Labradors. The next step is working out the possible gametes. And in this case, they can both produce these four possible gametes. So they could both have the option of donating both of the dominant alleles or both of the recessive alleles or one dominant E with the recessive B, and then the other way around, the recessive E with the dominant B. And then the next thing to look at the genetic cross is to put all of these gametes in a Punnett square. So for the male parents, we've got the four possible gametes here. And for the female parent, we can see the four possible gametes here. And what we then do is combine all the possible combinations to work out the genotype and then we can see the phenotype. So I've actually filled this in already and we've got here all of the possible genotypes and then within the box of the Punnett square I've written the phenotype as well. And we can see that the four down here, because those four all have two copies of the recessive E allele, that means it doesn't matter what the second gene's alleles are because they will be yellow. So that is our example of epistasis because that first gene is masking the expression of the second one. So even though they have the alleles to code for black, black, brown and black, we don't see that colour expressed because the first gene is masking it. So we end up with this ratio of 9 to 4 to 3. Now another way this could be represented and testing your knowledge is on a pedigree diagram. These are a bit like a family tree. So you have the eldest parents at the top um, and then it shows you their offspring. And then we can see these two then reproduced and here are their offspring. And you always get given a key. Circles always represent females, squares represent males, and in this case we've got the colours to indicate the fur colour. And some of the individual's genotypes are already included. 
So you could be asked to work out the genotypes of the remaining three individuals. And my tip, first of all, before we have a go, of how to always approach these questions is start off by filling in what you can identify straight away. And what I mean by that is if we have a look at this individual, they're brown in colour. So that means they must have at least one dominant E allele because they are expressing a colour other than the yellow. And because they're brown and brown was recessive, we know they must have two copies of the brown allele. So this is what we know. We just don't know from looking at that individual what the second allele for that E gene would be. And that is then when you need to have a look at the parents or it could be the offspring if they were, uh, if they did have offspring, to work out what the final allele must be. And I also always say, do this in pencil, because if you get it wrong, you can then just rub it out and have another go in the exam. If you do it in pen, you're gonna be crossing out and it could get really, really confusing. So in this example, both parents, um, we can see that there's only one dominant allele for the E gene, and that is in the father. So this offspring must have inherited that dominant allele from the father. So that is where that allele came from. So the second one has to come from the mother and the mother only has recessive alleles. So that is how we can work out the second allele would have to have been recessive. If we then have a look at these two individuals, we have this female here is black. So that means she must have at least one dominant E and one dominant B. We can't tell just from looking at her what the second allele is. Then if we look at this male offspring, they're brown, so they have to have at least one dominant E, but again, just like with this example over here, because they're brown, they must have two copies of the recessive B allele. So we then have to look up at the parents to work out what the missing alleles are. So for the black female offspring, Again, the dominant allele came from the father and the mother only has recessive E alleles. So that means they must have a recessive E as the second option. And for the B gene, which is whether they're black or brown, the dominant allele must come from the father. So that means the mother, they can only donate um, these two, one of these two recessive alleles. So that means they must be heterozygous. This one, again, is the same example pretty much as we saw over here. So we can see that, again, the dominant allele came from the father, so the recessive is going to be coming from the mother because she can only donate recessive alleles. So those are the kinds of questions you can get. And there's one final example we're going to have a look at where this actually came up in a past paper question and it's represented quite differently. So the squash fruit colour, students were given this information first of all. Gene one, you've got a dominant and a recessive allele. The dominant allele inhibits an enzyme that is needed to make squash either green or yellow in color. So if they have a dominant allele, that means the squash is actually white. If they have two copies of the recessive allele, that means the squash won't be white, it will be either green or yellow. Now, gene two is what determines whether it'd be green or yellow. So the dominant allele for gene two codes for an enzyme that functions normally to make the squash yellow in color. But if you had two copies of the recessive allele in the squash, then that would code for a non-functioning enzyme. So you would then not get the yellow color and instead you would get green. So if we have a look at the example then that was given in this particular exam question, they were shown this flow diagram as another way to represent the information above to show how you could end up with a phenotype, white, green or yellow, based on these genotypes on the outside, but it's presented quite differently. And what they were asked was, what fruit colour would you expect the following genotypes to have? So basically, what would be the phenotype for these genotypes? So if we have a look, 
you can either use the information at the top or the flow diagram here. And in fact, in the exam question, I don't think they were given the information at the top. They did have to work it out just from the flow diagram. So we'll do it that way. So this individual, um, Squash, has a dominant A. And what we're shown here is if you have for gene one, which is coding for the first enzyme, if you have a dominant allele, that means the enzyme is inhibited. So therefore, this reaction of going from white to green wouldn't happen. So that means the phenotype for this particular genotype would be white. So even though they've got the alleles for the second gene, it doesn't matter because the first gene is masking that expression. So that's how this is another example of epistasis. The second genotype this time we have two copies of the recessive allele for A, which means the fruit will be either green or yellow. And the way we can see that on the flow diagram is for gene one, which is the first enzyme, if you have two copies of the recessive allele, the enzyme's working, so that tells you you'll get potentially green. Then we have to look at the second gene, which is gene B, and there are two dominant alleles. And for this one, we can see if you have a dominant allele for gene 2, that means that enzyme 2 will work and green will be converted to yellow. So the phenotype for this genotype would be yellow. And that is just another example of epistasis and how this was assessed in an exam question. So that is it. That's all you need to know about epistasis for A-level biology. I hope you found it helpful. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up.